This tutorial video is designed to introduce you to the basic functions of QLab so that you can feel confident as a QLab operator during rehearsals and performances. The topics we'll be covering are divided into four main areas, workspace organization and navigation, playback controls, basic programming awareness, and troubleshooting. Any specific questions not addressed in this video should be answered by the designer who's programming the QLab QList. If you're interested in learning more about programming a QLab QList, feel free to explore the other tutorial materials available on the QLab website. Let's begin with a brief summary. QLab allows designers to program a list of sound, video, and control events that will start when they receive a specific trigger. In its most basic form, the list simply starts at the top and automatically advances as each event is triggered. In QLab, these events are referred to as cues and provide the basic building blocks used to play or modify the media in your show. An audio cue will play an audio file, a video cue will play a video file, and so on. Oftentimes, multiple cues are programmed to fire as the result of a single trigger, and this is referred to as a cue sequence. Starting a cue is typically referred to as going on a cue or firing a cue and firing the cues accurately and consistently is the operator's main responsibility. Firing cues in QLab is designed to be very easy, and of course the most basic thing you need to know as an operator is how to start and stop the playback of cues. You can select any cue in the cue list simply by clicking on it, and then to start playback of the cue, just hit your keyboard's spacebar or click on QLab's Go button. To stop the playback of all cues, hit the Escape key or click on the Stop All button in the QLab interface. You'll rarely hit the Escape key during a performance, but the Escape key is essential during rehearsals or emergencies to quickly stop all cues. To stop the playback of an individual cue while allowing other cues to continue playing, select the cue and hit the S key. We'll discuss more playback functions in a bit. Let's take a quick tour of the QLab workspace so that you know your way around. The term workspace is used in QLab to describe the interface that opens up whenever you open a QLab file. The QLab workspace presents a single consolidated window that consists of seven panels, many of which can be opened or closed depending upon what you want to see. To give you a quick overview, here's the name and location of each panel. The toolbar. The Go On Deck Notes panel, the Toolbox, the Current Cue List, the Active Cues panel, the Cue List Drawer, and the Inspector panel. As an operator, you're mainly going to be concerned with the Current Cue List, which is where most, if not all, of the cues that you'll be firing are located. We'll talk more about the current cue list in a bit, but first let's take a closer look at the other panels and how they can be useful to you as an operator. The toolbar offers a convenient location for several workspace controls. The very top of the toolbar displays the name of the workspace and the current cue list. If you right-click on the toolbar, you'll be presented with the option to customize the toolbar with whichever tools you and the designer find most useful. The Inspector, Toolbox, Active Cues, and Cue Lists buttons give you the opportunity to open or close each respective panel depending upon your working needs. Note that you can also open and close the toolbar by clicking on the small oval-shaped button in the top right corner of the workspace. The Load to Time slider can be very useful during rehearsals if you need to quickly get to a specific playback time within a cue or cue sequence. The lock button does just what it says. It locks the workspace in its current state to avoid any accidental changes. It's a good idea to lock the workspace once the designer has finished programming to ensure that you don't inadvertently make any changes to the cue list. Another very important item for operators is the load button. Clicking on the load button will load the currently selected cue into RAM to make it available for instant playback. If that cue is at the beginning of a cue sequence, then QLab will also load all of the subsequent cues in the sequence. A yellow dot next to a cue indicates that the cue is loaded. 
Note that when you go on a queue, QLab automatically loads the next queue into RAM, so during a performance you typically won't need to worry about loading queues manually. However, during rehearsals, the queue list is constantly stopped and modified, and it's vital to ensure that queues are loaded before going on them. It's not uncommon to have many audio files playing back simultaneously as part of a single queue sequence. If the queue sequence isn't loaded into RAM, there will likely be a significant delay between hitting the spacebar and playback actually beginning. This is obviously a problem, but it's easily solved by making sure that queues are always loaded prior to firing. The keyboard shortcut for loading a queue is the L key, and you'll likely use this shortcut a lot during tech rehearsals. Clicking on the Preferences button in the toolbar is one way to access the Workspace Preferences window, which is where you'll find a number of global settings for the workspace. The keyboard shortcut Command Comma will also bring up the Workspace Preferences window. Notice that the Display Mode Preferences allow you to change the font size and background of the current queue list. There are other options available in the toolbar, but most of them are self-explanatory. For further description of all toolbar options, see the QLab help document. The Go On Deck Notes panel contains the Go button for firing cues from the screen, shows you which cue is on deck to be triggered by the next Go, and has a space for displaying notes. The Notes area is a great place to type reminders or special instructions for cues. The Active Cues panel allows you to pause and restart the playback of cues within a currently running cue sequence, which can be very useful during rehearsals. The Cue List drawer displays the cue lists that are available within the workspace, and selecting a cue list from the drawer will make that cue list the current cue list. Most shows can function with only one cue list, but just be aware that it's possible to have multiple cue lists available within one workspace and there may be times when you'll be firing cues that are not located in the current cue list. If the designer is using multiple cue lists, ask them how the cues are organized so that you have a solid understanding of where all the cues are located. The Inspector panel is the location where parameters for each cue can be modified. Designers will always have the Inspector panel open while programming a cue list, but it's not really necessary to keep it open once the cue list is complete and the show is up and running. The Toolbox is a list of all the available queue types that the designer will use to build the queue list. Much like the Inspector panel, it's useful to keep the Toolbox open while programming the queue list, but it's not a panel that you need to keep open while operating the show. As mentioned earlier, selecting a specific queue is easily accomplished by clicking anywhere on the queue's row. Notice that the entire row of the selected queue is highlighted, once a queue is selected, you can easily move to the next queue by hitting the down arrow key, or move to the previous queue by hitting the up arrow key. If you want to jump to a specific queue number, the keyboard shortcut Command-J will bring up the Jump to Queue dialog window. The Group queue can be thought of as a folder for other queues. Groups are often used to organize queue sequences and add visual clarity to a queue list. You can collapse or expand a group's contents by clicking on the triangle icon that's located just to the left of the group queue's name. You can also use the left and right arrow keys to collapse and expand the selected group, or use the shift plus lesser than and greater than keys to collapse and expand all the groups in the queue list. Also note that a group and all of its internal queues will function exactly the same whether the group is collapsed or expanded. One last organizational item that we should discuss before moving on to the next section is how QLab files are organized on your computer. QLab files use the extension .qs, and you'll be opening the .qs file when you run the show, so you need to know where on the computer this file is located. Creating an alias to this file and placing it on the desktop will provide you with a quick way to open the show's QLab workspace. The QLab.Qs file doesn't contain any of the audio or other media files that are programmed into the queue list. It just points to those files wherever they happen to be on the computer. Ideally, the designer who's programming the queue list will set up a folder that contains all of the media files in one location, but you should check with the designer to find out how they've organized the files. Although you typically won't have to think about where the files are located, it's important to know where to find the QLab and media files in case you need to do any troubleshooting. Let's talk a bit more about the playback controls in QLab. To quickly review the fundamental playback controls mentioned earlier, the spacebar is used to go on the selected queue, 
The escape key stops all queues, the S key stops an individually selected queue, and the L key loads a selected queue into RAM. One important area of workspace preferences related to queue playback is DoubleGo protection, which is located in the general preferences. Here, you can set the minimum time between goes and require a key up event before rearming Go. It's typically a good idea to set a minimum time of at least 0.2 seconds to help protect against accidental triggers. Another common way to trigger the Go for a queue is by using a hotkey. Many of the keys on the keyboard can be assigned to trigger a specific queue. You can make a hotkey assignment for any queue in the Triggers tab of the Inspector panel. Hotkeys make a queue available for firing without having to program the queue into a specific place in the show. They can be placed anywhere in the workspace and still function, so it's common to place hotkey queues at the top of the show's main queue list or in a separate queue list altogether. For example, let's say you're running a show that has a gunshot in it, but the sound of the gun is supposed to come from the actual prop gun firing a blank. It's always a good idea in this type of situation to create a backup sound cue to be fired by a hotkey in the event that the prop gun doesn't fire correctly. Under normal circumstances, when the gun fires, the cue lab sound cue won't be needed. If the backup sound cue were programmed into that point of the cue list, you would have to skip over it manually. Instead, when that moment in the show arrives, you'd just be ready to trigger the hotkey if the prop gun doesn't fire. This is just one example of a hotkey scenario. There are a number of situations in which hotkeys can be very handy. Once again, the active cues panel is a useful panel to keep open during rehearsals in order to pause and restart cues. Note that there are also sliders available to move to different points within any active cue. The playback position is the black teardrop icon located in the far left column of the current cue list, and it indicates which cue is on deck for the next go. Typically, the playback position is linked to the selected cue so that by selecting a cue, you also change the cue that's on deck. However, during tech rehearsals, a designer may want to select cues from a remote computer and edit cue parameters without interrupting the operator's ability to go on the show's cue list. Fortunately, QLab has a general preference setting that allows the playback position to continue moving through the cue list independent of the selected cue. If you've disabled the link between the playback position and the selected cue, clicking on another cue will select that cue without affecting the playback position. If you'd like to move the playback position to another cue, simply click on the cue in the column below the playback position indicator. As an operator, you should be aware of some basic programming concepts so you can keep an eye out for any potential problems in the queue list or make simple adjustments if requested to do so by the designer. We'll just be touching briefly on these topics, so if you'd like to learn more about programming QLab, check out the other tutorial materials on the QLab support site. Really also, these programming concepts will likely become more clear as you work with QLab and observe how a queue list is programmed. Level faders for audio, fade, and video cues can be found in the Levels tab of the inspector. While there are a number of points in QLab's signal flow that can affect the final level, most level adjustments are made with the level faders. The continue mode of a cue is a very important aspect of programming and can be one of three states, non-continue, auto-continue, or auto-follow. Non-continue cues require an individual manual go trigger in order to fire. A cue that has auto-continue mode enabled will immediately pass along any go trigger to the next cue, thus firing both cues simultaneously. Finally, auto-follow will fire the next cue after the current cue's playback is complete. There is a continue mode column in the current cue list, which indicates each cue's continue mode setting. If no icon appears in the column, this indicates the cue is in non-continue mode, a downward arrow icon indicates the cue is in auto-continue mode, and a downward arrow with a circle at the top indicates the cue is in auto-follow mode. You should keep an eye on the continue mode column during rehearsals because it's one of the most common locations for subtle programming errors that can lead to not-so-subtle results. If you spot a potential programming error during rehearsal and tactfully bring it to the designer's attention in time for them to fix it, it will likely be very appreciated. The action column is essentially a duration indicator for the content of the cue. 
The pre-wait and post-wait columns allow the designer to program delays between queues, and they're typically used within queue sequences to coordinate the relative timing of multiple queues. When a queue with a pre-wait is fired, the pre-wait counts down before the action of the queue starts. A post-wait adds a countdown after the action of the queue has completed. You can change the timing indicators of the pre-wait, action, and post-wait columns to display either time elapsed or time remaining by clicking on the gray icon next to the column title. Fade cues are used to adjust the volume levels of audio or video cues and are among the fundamental cues in QLab. One parameter that you may be asked to adjust is the fade cues curve shape, which can be found in the curve shape and settings tab of the inspector. The fade cues curve shape can be adjusted by clicking in the curve display and dragging a control point. For a detailed explanation of the fade cue, please see the fade and group cues tutorial on the QLab support site. Arming and disarming cues is an easy way to turn cues on or off in the cue list. Cues that are disarmed appear as crossed out in the cue list and will not execute their action when they receive a go. Arming and disarming cues can be done manually via the info tab of the inspector. But it's also possible to program the arming and disarming of cues into a cue list, which can be very useful to prevent the accidental triggering of cues. For instance, it's a good idea when using a hotkey cue to arm the cue for only the window of time during which it might be needed. QLab is designed to be a powerful, robust, and intuitive tool for media playback, but as is always the case when learning how to work with new software, it is very possible that at some point you're going to run into a technical issue. So let's wrap up this tutorial by briefly touching upon some common issues you might encounter in QLab. If a queue in the current queue list has a red X in front of it, it's QLab's way of telling you that there's a problem with the queue and the queue won't execute properly. Here are three common causes of the red X. QLab must be patched into an output device of some sort in order to function properly. Audio, video, and MIDI cues all require specific output devices. All of these device assignments can be made by calling up the Workspace Preferences window, selecting the type of cue that you wish to assign to a device, and then dragging a patch connection between the QLab output patch and any of the devices that are recognized by your computer. Many cue types require a target of some sort, either a media file or another cue, and the red X will appear in front of any targeting cues that either do not have a target assigned or for which QLab can't find the specified target. This is why it's important to know where all the QLab media files are located so that in the event of a target location issue, you know where to look for the target files. Assigning a target to a queue is as simple as dragging the target file or target queue directly on top of the queue to which you want it assigned. There is also a Refresh Files button available on the toolbar to help with target issues. Clicking on the Refresh Files button forces QLab to reconnect queues with their target files. Fade queues that have a target queue assigned will still display a red X until the change has been made to the fade queue's level faders. Again, this is something you may want to keep an eye out for during rehearsals as the queue list is being programmed. Before every rehearsal and show, you need to run pre-show checks to make sure that all the equipment is working properly. At the very least, there should be a speaker check queue at the beginning of the queue list that automatically plays audio through each of the speakers in a specific order. The speaker check will confirm that all the speakers are functioning and that the signal routing from QLab to each speaker is still correct. Ideally, there should be another pre-show check queue prior to the speaker check that we'll call the QLab to mixer input check. This pre-show check queue should send a 1 kHz sine wave from every channel of QLab to your mixer's inputs at a specific level. If your mixing console has level meters, you should be able to see that the output from QLab to your mixer's input is where it should be. Typically, it would be unity gain on the mixer input. It's very important while playing this QLab to mixer input check that you make sure that the mixer outputs are muted so that the sine wave doesn't get played over the speakers. A 1 kHz sine wave played through the sound system at high volume is not good for the speakers and very unpleasant on the ears. In the event of a more serious problem with QLab, the console application is a useful place to find out what's happening under the hood of your computer. You can find the console application in the Utility folder of the Computer's Applications folder. The messages created by the console log are helpful for tracking down more complicated issues, 
and although it's unlikely that you'll run into such an issue, you should at least know how to open the console just in case a designer or QLab support specialist asks you to review the console log while troubleshooting a problem. Finally, if you need more information about QLab, you can always head over to the QLab website for documentation, tutorials, and access to the QLab mailing list. You can also email your questions directly to support at figure53.com.